Hi everybody, welcome to this lecture series on applied statistics and today's topic is the famous normal distribution. The normal distribution is a very common distribution in real life and in fact under various circumstances other data distributions approximate the normal distribution. For example, if you look at this picture on this slide and compare it with some graphs in previous lecture on binomial distribution, you will find some resemblance on occasions. The normal distribution is also called Gaussian distribution and it is a continuous probability distribution. Therefore, let's first discuss what is a continuous random variable. As against a discrete variable, which only takes fixed values such that there are no intermediate values in between those fixed values, a continuous variable or a real valued variable can take infinitely many values within any interval. Examples of continuous variables are heights of people. So, uh, for example, a height can be 1.66, 1.656 or 1.6566 meters. As you can imagine, you can split any two height values and can still produce infinitely many values in between. Another example is weight of people. Similarly, you can think of many examples of continuous variables yourselves. So the probabilities on, of a continuous variable are modeled by a probability distribution function or PDF. Can you remember from the previous lectures as to what models the probability of a discrete variable? Yes, it is called the probability mass function. Today we'll be talking about probability density functions because we are dealing with continuous variables. So let's return to the normal distribution. As I said earlier, it is a famous and most commonly used data distribution. As you can see, it looks like a bell, so its shape is also called a bell curve. A normal distribution is symmetric around its mean value. And if you remember from the lecture on descriptive statistics, median is what splits any data into two equal parts. In this case, because of the symmetry, the median is the same as the mean value. Now note, the total area under the bell curve sums to one. If you do not understand what is the area under the curve, refer to some calculus textbooks. However, briefly, here it means all the white space between the bell curve and the x-axis. Now, due to symmetry, the area on the left and right side of the mean is the same, and that is one half. The PDF of the normal distribution is represented by the function given on your slide. Here, mu is the mean of the distribution and sigma represents the standard deviation. Now coming from discrete probability distributions in the past lectures, you immediately may want to calculate the probability of any single value of the random variable x. We can do that for discrete random variables, but unfortunately not for the continuous variables. And the reason is that the continuous variables have infinite values within any interval. For example, between 1.0 and 1.1, infinitely many values exist. And if you assign any non-zero probability to each individual value, then the sum of the probabilities will be infinite. Think about it if you want to and pause the video. Whereas the sum of the probabilities should always be one. Therefore, the probability of a particular continuous value is zero. Hmm, sounds weird, doesn't it? And then the question is, how can we measure probabilities of continuous random variables? Well, for continuous variables, instead of measuring the probability of a particular value, we compute the probability of a range of va values. For example, what is the probability that the class heights fall between 1.5 meter and 1.6 meters. Now, how do we find that? 
Remember, we earlier said that the total area under, under the curve is 1. The keen viewers should have suspected that the total area of 1 equates to the sum of all the probabilities because the probability is also sum to 1. Therefore, the probability of a range of values is equal to the area under the bell curve for the corresponding range of values. In this case, this, rep this is represented by the yellow area between K1 and K2. Now consider another example. Suppose there is a certain kind of bacteria uh, and these bacteria live only between four to six hours. Okay. Now if we want to try to find the probability of uh, living for a particular time, for instance, if we want to try what is the probability for living for exactly 5.0000000000 and you can just keep going on indefinitely hours to be absolutely precise, then the probability of that happening is really zero. Why? Because the chances of measuring time to that infinite precision are zero. What we perceive as five hours may actually be a very tiny fraction above or below the exact value of five, and we can, not, can never be sure. Therefore, we compute the probability of finding all the values in a given range. But how do we compute the probability of all the values in a given range? Since the total area under the curve is one, the area within the range is equal to the area under the curve up to the upper limit K2 minus the area under the curve until the lower limit of K1. But how do we compute the area under the curve up to any limit? Let's just drop the subscripts now and call the limit just K. Well, we simply have to accumulate all the area and hence all the probability to the left of k. Now can you remind me what function in probability theory accumulates the probabilities up to any given point? Think about it. I hope you figured it out and yes it is called a cumulative distribution function or CDF. The CDF of a normal distribution is represented by this Greek, uh, capital Greek letter called phi. Phi is a complicated function as given on the screens, but do not worry about its detail. Instead, simply focus at its shape. Notice as we move to the positive infinity, the accumulated area approaches one. That is expected because sum of all probabilities is one. Instead, when we move to the left, that is negative infinity, the sum total of probabilities approaches zero. Now here is what we can how we can compute the probability of a range of values of a normal, normally distributed random uh, variable in the statistical software R. R uses the p-norm function to compute the CDF of the normal distribution. So if mean equals zero and standard deviation sigma equals one, then the probability of all the values below the mean value of zero can be computed by calling p-norm with threshold zero and setting mean and standard deviation accordingly. So we do that and the answer are you surprised you shouldn't be because remember we said that the total area equals one and the normal distribution is symmetric about its mean value so if mean equals zero then half the area or probability lies on either side of it next we can compute a range between zero and negative 0.5 so first we call p norm for the higher value and then we subtract the result of calling p norm with the lower value and the answer is approximately 0 0.19. Now a normal distribution can be 
distributions can be infinitely many. This is because the normal distribution has two parameters, namely mu and mean. Sorry, mu or mean, and sigma or standard deviation. Changing the values of these parameters changes the distribution. Let's focus at changing the standard deviation sigma in this slide. Sometimes sigma squared or variance is used instead of the standard deviation, but the effect is the same. So when sigma equals 1, the distribution looks like this. However, when sigma increases to 1.5, the distribution spreads out. Likewise, when we, when we increase the standard deviation to 2, it spreads even more. And so the trend continues. The expected value of a normal distribution is its mean value mu. And changing the mean value moves the entire distribution left or right. So if mean equals zero, here is how it looks. If we shift the mean to the right, that is we set mean equals one, then the distribution shifts to right. Further shifting the mean to 2.0 further shifts the distribution to right. The normal distribution is famous for how it splits the random values within different standard deviations. It is called the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. What this means is that if a variable is normally distributed and we randomly select its values, then these values will be one standard deviation away from the mean 68.3% of the times two standard deviations away from the mean 95.4% of the times, and three standard deviations away from the mean 99.7% of the times. So that's, like I said, is a very famous property of the normal distribution, and later on we'll see we'll use this property to develop uh, further statistical tests, especially in hypothesis testing methods. This property is used quite a lot. So here are some examples of normal distributions in real life. These include heights of a group of people, stock returns over a short period of time, and average values of sample values. This last example, in fact, is such an important result that we shall cover it separately under the topic called central limit theorem. So if you do not fully understand what I mean here, do not worry, we'll, uh, we'll devote considerable time on that. Note the real data is not always per perfectly normal though, and may only approximate a normal distribution, for example, as shown in this picture. Therefore, there are multiple statistical tests that check whether a data set is normally distributed or not. And we shall see that in another lecture. It is also important to note that many real life examples do not follow a normal distribution. These include stock returns over a long period of time as, a, as opposed to short period of time when it does follow the normal distribution, and salaries of different people. Obviously, there's a small fraction of people who earn much more than the rest of the population. So this situation is exemplified by this plot uh, on, the, on the slide. So clearly, you can see this doesn't look like a normal distribution. So while normal distribution is popular and common, it is not always the case. Finally, although we have described uh, the normal distribution in terms of its mean and standard deviation, it, it is quite common to describe the same in terms of the mean and the variance. Okay, so therefore, instead of using sigma, you know, uh, oftentimes we say the normal distribution is, is defined in terms of sigma square, which is the variance. So, uh, you know, before you start doing any calculations, always check. Okay. With that, I conclude this lecture, and I hope to see you next time around. Bye.